those flowers in their home. And we want to share God's words with you tonight. First, I want to ask, to ask you to look at a Bible text in Proverbs chapter 4, verse 10. And here it says, Listen, my son, accept what I say, and the years of your life will be many. Hold on to instruction. Do not let it go. Guard it well, for it is your life. And this is word from Solomon, and he has experience in his life that if he follow God's word, follow God's instruction, then he will be prosper. But you know the story of Solomon, how he had uh, gone astray to other places, but eventually he came back. So through his experience, he said, if you were willing to listen to God's words, then the years of your life will be many. In Chinese New Year, usually we have greetings to people. Uh, if you see some people, you, you say a good greeting. And usually the greeting is talking about you have a prosperous life, you have a long life. And here, if you look at the Bible, it says that if you listen to God's word, and the years of life will be many. We all have a mouth where we can speak, we can share with people. There is a story talking about a little boy in the southern part of the United States, and towards evening time, the little boy is playing in the yard. And he's playing, he's, he's jumping in the yard. His finger is pointing to the moon. And he tells his mom, he said, Mom, Mom, one day I want to go to the moon. If you were the mom, what would be your reaction to that little boy? You would say, well, maybe it's something that you look for, but I don't know. Uh, maybe it's just your dream. But that little boy's mom said, yeah, it's good. Maybe one day you will be on the moon. But now it's supper time. Just come and come and eat. But this little boy later went to the moon. And his name was Neil Armstrong. And he went to the moon because the words that his mom told him. And his mom was not saying that, well, it's not impossible. I mean, it's not possible. But his mom was affirming, one day you may have the opportunity. Our words can make big impact. What you say, how you say it, in what kind of circumstance you say it, can always impact people around you. There's a Bible text in Psalms 119, 105 says, Your word is a lamp for my feet, a light on my path. Well, these words on the side is the, says the same thing in Chinese. Uh, you, you cannot read Chinese. You don't know Chinese. But it's the same exactly as what's said in English. These words are written by a church member there in Hong Kong. Usually in the Chinese tradition, during Chinese New Year, there is a tradition. If, I don't know if you have seen picture of Chinese New Year. Usually on outside the door on, on your frame, there are these kind of red banner with words on the side. And every Chinese New Year, you put these words of blessing on your door, and they are red. And I don't know if you can think of anywhere in the Bible talking about red color on your doorpost. Can you remember? That's in Exodus, right? When the people of Israelites, they were getting ready to go, and God told them that you need to put blood on your door frame, doorpost. And then 
the angel is going to skip over, it will not harm the firstborn of your family. I don't know if the Chinese has the same idea, but every year in the Chinese New Year, you will see this red banner on the side on top with words of blessing to show that you will have another year blessing in the New Year. But today we are talking about God's words. God's words is a blessing to us. Psalms 119.105 says, Your word is a lamp for my feet, a light on my path. So we want to talk about tonight your word, God's word. It's not, not our, our word, but God's word. Of course, you all have Bible, and nowadays with advance of technology, not only Bible in your hand, we print printed Bible, there are digital Bibles on your phone, on your iPad, on your computer. You can all read God's Word. In, in 1813, there is a uh, missionary into Asia in, the, in our part of the world. His name is Robert Morrison. And he, when he came to our parts of the world, he said, I need to bring God's word to people of Chinese. And he started to translate the Bible. So in 1813, he translated New Testament into Chinese. If you ever have a chance to come to our parts of the world, go to Hong Kong or go to Macau, which is very close to Hong Kong, and just take a ferry about less than an hour from Hong Kong, you go to Macau. Now there's also bridges, there's, there is a highway connected from Hong Kong to Macau. And if you ever come to, to Macau, you will see the tomb of Robert Morrison. And if you can read Chinese, it will tell you that Robert Morrison is the person, first person that translated the Bible to Chinese because he knows that the Word of God is powerful. He knows that the Word of God can change people's lives. And that's why he wants to bring words of God to people who are there in, in China, in Hong Kong, in uh, those people who are reading and thinking of, or talking Chinese. He said, if they only have English, it will not be good. They need to have God's words in Chinese. So he translated the Bible into Chinese, 1813. Uh, now today, we all have our New Testament, Old Testament in Chinese. And we thank God for a missionary like Robert Morrison. He is able to translate, give us the word God in Chinese. But do you know today, largest printing of Bible in the world, where is it printed? You think about maybe a Christian country, maybe U.S., maybe some other places. But I tell you, right now, the largest printing press of Bible in the world is in China. And in the city of Nanjing, that's, there is a press called Amity Printing Company. And it is set up by the United Bible Society. And it is the largest printing press for Bible. I have had an opportunity to visit that place, and these are pictures uh, you can see here on the, on the side, red painted, red, red color, that's Chinese Bible. But right now, if you go there, you will be able to see Bible printing in many different languages, and even English, Spanish, or other languages that's printed in that Bible printing press. And in the past, some people asked me, can people in China have Bibles? I said, yes, it's printed right there in China. Some years ago, and when Bible were not readily available in China, people tried to bring Bible through the border uh, into China. And you, you may have heard stories that, that people would put a, ba a, a bag of Bibles in the bag and throw into the water, and hopefully that the Bible can wash up shore. Many years ago that happened, but today there's no need to so-called smuggle Bible into the border, into China. 
It's printed right there in China. I wonder why does God allow God allow Bible printed in China? Because He know we really need it. China has one fourth of world population, and all of that people in China they need God's word, and God wants to bring His word to His people. So Guinness World Record said the best-selling book of all time is Bible. Five to six billion copies of Bible around the world. Basically, probably everyone has a copy. This is only t talking about printed Bible. But if you counted Bible in your phone, Bible on, on the tablet, Bible on your computer, probably even double that amount of, of uh, uh, statistics. It is the best-selling book. It is the best book of all time. And we know it because we read the Bible every day. But I want to share with you a few Bible texts. How can we be sure that God's word is so important? Genesis 1 says, In the beginning God created heaven and earth, and God said, Let there be light, and there was light. God was able to turn energy into material things. And God only spoke, and then there was light. Psalms 33 verse 9 says, For he spoke, and it came to be. He commanded, and it stood firm. God, using his word, he was able to command, and he spoke, it came to be. And then there is also the story you know about the, how Jesus fed the 5,000. And there were only five loaves, two fish. And the little boy came up to the disciples. He was getting ready and Probably that morning, his mother told him that, oh, you're going to listen to Jesus. Take some food with you. By the time Jesus finished, everybody was hungry. Jesus asked his disciples, well, you find food for them. They said, well, it's not possible. So many people, how can we feed so many people? And this little boy, he came. He said, I can share. I have five loaves, two fish. I can share. Would I, how could I share with so many people? But Jesus took his five loaves and two fish, and he looked up to the heaven. He gave thanks and broke the loaves and gave them to his disciples. They all ate and were satisfied. And Bible says not only they were able to feed all of them, they pick up a basket full of broken pieces of bread and fish, the number of men who had eaten was 5,000. And, and then also there were women, there were children, but more than 10,000 people, they were there. Only from this five loaves and two fish. Because Jesus, when he speak, when he command, when he speak the wor word of power, it can multiply. Then there is also the story in Mark. Jesus was tired. He was on a boat, and he fell asleep. Then there's great wind, and everybody was scared. And the disciples said, Jesus, Jesus, we're going to die. You don't even care about us. And Jesus got up. He rebuked the wind and said to the waves, quiet, be still. Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. The wind, the storm, listen to Jesus. How powerful Jesus' word is. And even when Jesus was on the cross, Jesus cried out in a, in a loud voice, says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I often think about Jesus' words when he was nailed on the cross. Ellen G. White says, at that moment, God turned away. He could not bear to look at his son suffer on the cross. And Jesus, 
He knew that his mission, he knew that what he was going to do, he knew that he had to suffer, he had to die on the cross. But still, at that moment, he had nothing else to rely on except the promise of God that he is going to save his people. So he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was relying on the word of God because God had already promised him. What was God's promise? Genesis 3.15, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. And from the moment in Genesis 3.15, God already said, you, my son, Jesus, you will be victorious. Amen. So with that hope, with that firm foundation in God, even though he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He knew that he is going to come through. So that's why John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. So from several Bible texts, we know, we hear, we, are, we affirm that God's word is really powerful. This week, I visit Bermuda Institute and uh, I met a teacher called uh, Richard Sutton, and he showed me a painting named Light My Way. I was very intrigued by this painting, and I so asked him, I said, can I show your painting in the sermon that I'm going to preach? And he shared with me that in the old times that uh, the rich people, when they go around, there's really no need to have lantern, but for the poor people, at night, they need to have lantern here because the street is dark. So that's why he painted his picture with the name Light My Way. When I look at this picture, I thought about the, uh, uh, sorry, the, the Bible text in uh, Psalms 119, 105. Your word is a lamp for my feet, a light on my path. Little, this little boy is handing that light to the lady because he knew that when she's going forward, she will need the lamp when there's darkness around. She will need a lamp to light her path. That's why he's handing that lantern to her. And for us, do we really understand, do we really see how God's words can light up my feet, can be a lamp to my path? Ellen G. White, in 1844, December of 1844, when she was only 17 years old, she saw her first vision. And you have read in life sketches that Ellen G. White described her first vision. And that first vision really talks about a light from Jesus. And I'm just getting a few sentences in that uh, uh, vision. He said, they had the bright light set up behind them at the beginning of the path, which an angel told me was the midnight cry. The light shone all along the path and gave light for their feet so that they might not stumble. And in the vision, Ellen Dewey saw that there is a path of people walking towards heaven, towards their destination. And some parts is, is in dark and they had a bright light set up behind them and illumi illuminating the path. And the angel told them that bright light is the midnight cry. And the light shone along the path and 
for their feet so that they are able to go forward, they will not stumble. As I think about this midnight cry, I think about the, Je- the, the parable that Jesus had talked about in Matthew 25. You know the parable, the wise and foolish virgin. And the Bible says, because the bridegroom was late, they all became drowsy and fell asleep. The bright ones and the foolish ones, they all fell asleep. They all fell asleep. And then what happens? At midnight, the cry ran out. Here is the bridegroom. Come out to meet him. And we knew what happened. The wise ones, they had oil prepared, and they were ready to meet uh, uh, to meet the uh, bridegroom. But for those foolish ones, they, although they also had lamp, but they had not prepared enough oil. So they, they asked the wise one, can you share the oil with us? They said, well, we don't have enough. Why don't you go buy some? But by the time they went to buy the oil, they came back, they knocked on the door. This is what happened. The owner said, truly, I tell you, I don't know you. Although they knock on the door, they said, oh, we have been waiting for you. Now we are ready. But they are not allowed to come into the celebration with the bride and bridegroom. Then the Bible says, therefore, keep watch because you do not know the day or the hour. The minute cry is that it's going to wake us up. We are in a situation because from 1844, October 22, we are in the last days. From that day, we begin to understand what is the prophecy of 2300 days. Well, from that day, we understood that Jesus did not come on October uh, 22, 1844. He went to the most holy place. He started the investigative judgment. But, but we know that time period is not going to last forever. So that's why Jesus said, you need to keep watch. You need to prepare. That's why there's a midnight, midnight cry calling that the bridegroom is going to come. So that's why in Jesus, I mean, in Ellen G. White's, uh, his, her uh, vision, he said, the light shone all along the path. As long as they kept their eyes fixed on him, they were safe. But soon some grew, grew weary. Then Jesus would encourage them by raising his glorious right arm. Others rushed in, denied the light behind them, and they stumbled and lost sight of the mark and of Jesus and fell off the path. It says very clearly, as long as they kept their eyes fixed on him, they were safe. But some, they, they uh, became weary. Some, they, they questioned, is this is really we, we should be looking at him or not? They denied the light behind them, and they stumbled, and they fell off the path. So that's the difference. If we are able to fix our eye on Jesus, if we are able to look at Jesus, and then we will go on, even though it's a dangerous path, even though we may, if we, if we are not careful, we may stumble, but Jesus' light shine upon us, then we will be, to, be able to see very clearly. So Psalms 119, 105, your word is a lamp for my feet, a light on my path. We need to have Jesus' lamp, Jesus' word on our path, then we can go forward. A couple other words in the Bible says, 119, 130 says, the unfolding of your word gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. And then also 119.11 says, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. So we as Christians, as Seventh-day Adventists, we, are, we should be the one that keep God's words in our heart. 
We should be the one that always remember God's words in our heart. We should be the one that always have God's words in our heart. So when we go into places where there is dark, we know God's word can illuminate our path. We can go forward. I want to share with you a story of my father. This picture, as you can see here, was taken when he's reading his Bible. Some of you have heard story of my parents. I'm going to share that more tomorrow and tomorrow evening. But I want to, I want to share one story that how he kept God's word in his heart. Well, he was in the labor camp. Why he was in the labor camp, I'm going to tell you more next time. But today, I'm going to share with you that he was in the labor camp. And because he was in the labor camp, he had no Bible with him because he was not allowed to have a Bible in his hand. So he was start to memorizing, start to remember the Bible text that in his head. So he, he took out a small notebook start writing those Bible texts into his notebook. And every day as he memorized, as he started thinking about God's words, he would put down those words into his small notebook. Because he knew that when he put God's words into his heart, God's word is going to encourage him, is going to inspire him. So every day he writes, when he remember a Bible text he had read before, he, in his mind, he start writing them in his notebook. So his, this notebook of God's word became a treasure for him. He always, he put, hide in his inner pocket. But he, while he was in the labor camp, quite often there are inspection. People come and they inspect that if you have anything that you're not supposed to have. So that day he was, uh, in the labor camp, he was working in the clinic, and suddenly everybody in the camp was called out to the square, and everybody lined up. They were to be searched. And he had no time to hide a notebook somewhere in, in a safe place. And he was asked to go out to the square, everybody lined up to be searched. And he saw people be, uh, in front of him was searching, and he prayed to God, God, please, don't let them to find my notebook. It's okay if they punish, uh, if they punish me, but I, because your word is so precious, I don't want to lose this notebook. Please, God, please help me. But one by one, one by one, coming close to him, he has nowhere to hide. Just a few people before him, Suddenly, he was called back to the clinic. Because they said, well, there is an emergency in the clinic. You need to go. You need to go. So he left. He was very relieved. He was very happy that his notebook was not discovered. So afterwards, after uh, everything is finished, and they... Uh, he started talking to the uh, person that in charge of the clinic. And uh, the person asked him, um, uh, were you uh, searched today? He said, oh, well, uh, I was waiting to be searched, but uh, they called me because there is an emergency in the clinic, so I came. The person who was in charge of the clinic, he said, oh, I didn't know that you were not searched. I, we, I thought you had already been searched. That's why I call you come here. Uh, but uh, God was in control. God was at that time was looking at after him, and he was able to keep his pocket notebook full of Bible texts that he had memorized. And he praised God, not because he was safe, but because that he had that notebook in his back pocket, he was, uh, he was able to continue to keep it. So he 
hide he, like the Bible says, he hid his God's word in his heart because he does not want, want to sin against God. First Peter 3, 15 says, Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. We encounter people. We, uh, we uh, at different places at different times that we uh, get in touch with different people. And sometimes we ask, why do, why do you believe in God? And it's not just what we say. Quite often, people observe us of what we do. And in, I guess, in Bermuda here, there are probably a higher percentage of Christian or a high percentage, percentage of uh, Adventists. But in our parts of the world, there are not so many Adventists. There are not so many Christians. And we have to be careful when we share with others. But people will notice you are different, especially when they are with you sometime. They observe, they see how you are different. And then they will, eventually they will come and ask you the question, I see you are different. Why are you so different? Then you get opportunity to share, as the Bible says, prepare to give an answer for everyone to ask you. And that's always better because they are interested. They want to know why you are different. Then you get an opportunity to share. I want to share with you a story of two brothers that I met last year, how they shared their belief with others. These two brothers, I had the opportunity to meet some brothers and sisters in a certain part of the uh, country. And as we finished our meeting uh, during the day, in the evening, they knocked on my door. They came to my room. They said, Brother Zhao, I want to share with you some of my, our own experience. I said, sure, please, let's sit down and I will listen to you. And these two brothers, they said, we want to share in this particular city of the Adventist message. But we cannot share openly. If you know anything about China, uh, uh, you are not allowed to have public evangelism meetings. You cannot allow to go hand, a, hand a, 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 a book or pamphlet to somebody. You cannot do that. But they said, we still want to share Jesus' name to people that they don't know, they don't know about him. And they said, how do we do that? They said, why don't, you, why don't we go together to a city where we can have some health lecture with people and also do some health screening for people. Perhaps as people, they are interested in, in health, we can help them. So these two brothers, they tell with me that they went to a city, they set up a small tent where people can come in, they will uh, maybe have a, a take their blood pressure, and they also have a place where they can give people massage. So they set up this little tent to come, come there. They didn't say that they were Christian or Adventists. They were just doing some community service. So they there. They were, they were there, and they were uh, doing uh, uh, service to the people. And they shared with me. They said, but in their heart, they are praying, God, please give us opportunity to share the name of Jesus with people. So they, as they were setting up the tent of their they were providing service to people. They saw a person that uh, he was walking like this. No, he, obviously his leg was, had some trouble. So they invite this person come into the tent. They, they asked the person, they said, could we give you a massage, help your leg circulation to be better? So this, this, person said, yeah, sure, I would be happy to sit here and please give me a massage. So this brother brought this person sitting down there. He stopped praying as he was giving massage. He said, pray to God. He said, this 
Obviously, this person may have a stroke. That's why he's one, of, one side of his leg is not uh, uh, able to use properly. He said, God, I know that in your time, Jesus, you have healed people. I want to pray to God, God, please use me. Use your power to heal this person so that he could walk. So as he was massaging his leg, and he massaged more, after a while, the person feels better. The blood starts circulating, circulating in his leg. Then he said, you stand up and walk. You just stand up and walk. And the person did not quite believe that he could, his leg could, could heal, uh, recover so, so quickly. And he gingerly, he got up, he started walking, and he was able to walk normally. He was so happy. He said, oh, well, how could you heal my leg like this? Then he got an opportunity because when you ask, the Bible says when you ask, give you the reason, then you can share. So he said, yes, not me. I cannot do anything. But I was praying the heavenly God, he healed you. And this person said, Wow, if your God is so powerful, can do this. I want my relative, I want my family, come. You can all help them. And these two brothers, as they come into this new city, they were looking for places where they can gather people to worship together. And this person, his leg, by God's miracle, just been healed. And he said, please come to my home. Come to my home. I will invite my family. I will invite my relative. You, we will all come together and hear the words of God. And God provided. They did not go out to a public street uh, proclaiming, oh, come listen to the message of God. They were doing a service. They prayed, and God gave them a miracle to heal this person. And this person with his leg being healed, he was inspired. He invited them to come to his home. And pretty soon, they were able to set up a small family church in that, in that person's home. So God says, we need to hide his words in our heart so that we can be prepared. Whenever people ask us we, the reason of, of our belief, we can share with people. So that's always good for us to remember God's word in our heart. So I want to share with you an acronym called ACT. This is not something that I find online. I was praying to God. I said, God, how can I share this with people that's easy for people to remember? That's how we can have God's words into our life every day. So A represents attention. What does it mean, attention? Meaning that you need to pay attention to God's words every day. You need to put God's words into your mind every day. And my suggestion, I have talked to other people that you can memorize God's words one verse every week. One verse every week, I don't think that's too much. If I tell you today, you, you need to memorize a verse every day, it might be difficult. 365 verse a year, that might be difficult. But today, if I tell you to memorize one verse a week, I think you can do it, I can do it, all of us can do it. So just pay attention to God's word, 52 verse per year. And if you can do that, God is going to, God is going to bless you. Secondly, I call it chronicle. Oh, Bible, there's first and second chronicle. What does, what does mean by chronicle? I mean to write a daily journal of your experience with God. I don't know if you have a journal experience or not. If you haven't, it's very easy. You get a notebook, you start writing today. If you are good on your phone, your tablet, your computer, you can use a notepad, notepad app on your computer, or there are apps you can download where you can write a daily devotional record with God every day. 
I encourage you to do that. As you write this devotional journal, you will experience how God has been with you every day. What I do usually is that I will record parts of the Bible text I have been reading for that day. And I will not close my notebook until I hear from God what God has taught me for that part of the lesson, for that part of the Bible text. And I will write a few words, write a few sentences down. This is what I learned by reading that part of the Bible text. And then I will also write down my prayer for that day. My prayer could be that I will be praying for my wife, I will be praying for my children, I will be praying for those people who are sick, I will write down those prayer requests. And then for pastors, I often get ideas when I read certain Bible passage. I will jot down one or two ideas, these ideas I could use in my sermon. So quite often people ask me, where do you get ideas for your sermon? I said, that's from my daily reading of the Bible. I, I will be reading every day, and every day I will have a sermon idea. So if you ask me to preach every day, I will not be afraid, because every day I have an idea I can share with you, because it's not my own idea, it's idea that from reading the Bible. So I will, I will write every day to have that record in my journal, and whenever I need to present a Bible text idea, I will go through my journal, I'll find many ideas I can use in my, from my journal. And third is, act is T, I mean tell. When you have memorized Bible text, when you have writing down a journal, that is not enough. You need to share with people. And tell meaning you share with people anytime. Whenever, as I share with the, the Bible text, whenever people ask you, whenever there's an opportunity for you to share, you need to be ready to share. What I mean is that you need to have things you can share with people. And how are you to be ready? You need to memorize Bible text in your heart. You need to have journal in your journal book. That's why you have wealth of information you can share with people whom you are in contact with. So basically, attention, chronicle, and tell. I don't know if that's good English or not, but uh, that's what I have used to ask people to remember. You can memorize one Bible text each week. You can remember to journal your, your journey with God every day, and then you are ready to tell people whenever there is an opportunity. I want to share with you a personal testimony. You can see here, I have a general app of calendars on the left side, that's September, October 2023. And what do you notice? There are some white spots, meaning that I had omitted. I was not able to complete our journal entry for that day. And I have been praying to God. I said, I'm a pastor. I'm a minister. I should be able to Theoretically, God, I, need, I should be reading the Bible, having a journal every day. But that's the reality. I'm very, I'm sharing with you from, from my heart. I had holes in my calendar. There were days that I had no entry. So I pray to God, God, please help me. I want to treasure your, your words in my heart. If I cannot do it myself, how can, how can I share with other people, share with others, and encouraging others to do? So God, please help me. I want to do that. this, I want to have a journal, have this entry every day. And on the right side, this is uh, this year, end of last year and this year, you can see here what happened. There's no white window. 
It's all filled. I praise God. I ask God, God, please help me to remind me that I will have that time with you every day. And God, remind me every day to have that journal entry in my calendar every day. It's not something I can do it alone. It's not something I can do it myself. It's something that God is enabling me. God is helping me. Holy Spirit is moving in my heart so that I can remember his word. I can write down his word. I can have all the prayers that in my journal, I can always remember how God, how good God is. I know you can also do it. Today, I'm talking from my heart. I know all of you, you can also do it. I don't know of your life. I don't know where you are. I don't know where you are with Jesus, but I hope that every one of you, you, have, you will have intimate relationship with Jesus. You will have a daily walk with Jesus. And the only way to do that is to use some tools. I said, you memorize 52 verses a year, you write a daily journal. All those are tools to help you to build up that habit of walking with Jesus every day. I hope God used me as an agent to share his words with people I have contact with. And I hope all of you God will also use you as God's agent to share it with people that you have contact with. Every day, our life is different. Everyone's life is different. But we all make a difference. We can all share what God has inspired in our heart with people around us. I pray that God will move in your heart. I pray God will help you to be closer to him every day. Finally, I have a QR code. And I would encourage if you have a phone to take a picture of this QR code and to have a form. This QR code goes to a form that's from our Chinese Union mission. And you can pray for us. You can support us. And just by scanning this QR code, you will know what it is. I thank you for the opportunity for me to share tonight. And I want to ask you to continue to pray for me. I will share tomorrow and also have more time to share uh, in the evening. I pray that God will use me as his instrument to share his wonderful news to everyone. Thank you. Could we give the Lord a hand clap of praise for the message this Amen. Could we give the Lord a hand clap of praise? Amen. <laughs> praise God. Dr. Zhao, thank you very much for your message today. It was inspiring, but it was also kind of um, awakening. Could you imagine going to jail for having the Word of God in your possession? I, I'm, I'm asking you, can you imagine going to jail because you have the Word of God in your possession? My goodness, my goodness, praise God for that. And then also the courage to nonetheless know that you, you could go to jail, but you're still going to do it. Isn't that amazing? And then finally, finally, I mean, there, there was a lot uh, there, but things that arrested my attention were that there were restrictions in sharing God's word, but you're going to be as wise as serpents. Amen? Amen. So you're going to find a way <laughs> to share God's word. Praise be to God. Praise be to God. Our message for tomorrow. Our message for tomorrow is called Perspective. Dr. Zhao, 
will be speaking at the 11 o'clock hour. Those of you watching us online, we appreciate very much you being with us. Please, let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Father God, thank you for this opportunity that you have given to us. Thank you, Father, for the blessing and the ministry that you've given to Dr. Zhao. Thank you, Father, for the witnesses that we have in China and in other parts of the world. Father, truly, your word is being shared throughout the world, Father. Truly, everyone who ha wants to hear the word can and is given the opportunity to hear the word. We praise you for that. Now, Lord, we pray that you would continue to bless the ministries of all of those online and those watching, those doing ministry face-to-face, -face, hand to hand Father, those doing digital ministry, we pray for all of them. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Please remain seated. Um,